There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second. You cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include chapter one, a will to do his will, Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids. Chapter 5, Gives a Suggested Bible Study Program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. In light of everything that's been going on in our nation, we want to begin our series of studies tonight looking at the decline of a nation. We want to go back and notice what happened with the nation of Israel and then come forward to see what's happening within our nation and what the true problem is. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we read about Israel and how the nation of Assyria came against them, laid siege to the city of Samaria, and eventually took the city of Samaria, but then carried the people away captive into foreign lands. And the question is, why did that happen to ancient Israel? We begin then by reading in 2 Kings 17, verse 7 and following. We're going to have a little bit longer reading here, but we're going to read about what happened and why it happened. It says in 2 Kings 17, verse 7, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel which they had made. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God, things that were not right, 
And they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. Then they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images in every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. And they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffen their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. So as we read that, and if you recall your Old Testament history, how that the nation of Israel, the northern nation after Israel uh, was united under Saul, David, and Solomon, remember they split into two kingdoms. You had the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, and we're reading about this northern kingdom of Israel and eventually what happened to them. But basically what happened is at the very beginning when they were established, they began to worship God in an idolatrous manner. They had made calves and set them up as images through which they would worship Jehovah God in heaven. But as time went by, there was a steady rot and a steady decay in that nation going away from God. And terrible things were being done by them. And so God appealed to them through the prophets. He sent prophets to try to get them to repent of their sins and turn back to him. He sent disasters, calamities. He sent their enemies against them to try to humble them before him. But these people were stiff-necked, they were hard-hearted, they were stubborn, they were determined to do evil, and so it just kept getting worse and worse, eventually to the point where God said he was finished with them, and he destroyed them. He carried them off into captivity, and as far as history is concerned, that nation never existed again. So we see a decline of the nation and the collapse of a nation because they did not respect and honor God and the commandments that he had delivered to them. Our nation right now is in a time of crisis. It's beyond obvious that we have very fundamental, very real problems that are taking place. You think about over this past year, over the past spring and summer, all the riots and all the looting that took place and it was praised, it was endorsed, it was uh, excused by many leaders in our society. And we look at that and we wonder how in the world could that happen? We see that there are institutions that we once revered, that we once trusted in, that are crumbling and falling apart. And we also notice, of course, that families are being destroyed in our nation. And it causes us to have a measure of anxiety and concern for what the future holds, either for ourselves, for our children, or for our grandchildren. A concern about our nation and exactly where it's going to end up in the next 
few years or the next few decades. And so we want to think about that for a little bit in our study together tonight. And the first thing that we want to notice is, and maybe this goes without saying, but the United States is in a state of moral decline. It is rotting from within. You know, some deny that it's in a state of moral decline. And the reason they deny that is because they have a different view on the world. They have a different perspective and standard that they live by. You know, there are some of us who live by what's called the Judeo-Christian ethic. And our worldview is a very specific worldview. As we look out, we we believe there are certain things right, certain things wrong, and we generally agree on those things, at least in the moral realm. But then there's this other view that we're going to term as the secular humanist worldview. And these two views, the Judeo-Christian and the secular humanist, are two radically different views. And the secular humanist view is that the United States is actually getting better when you see these things that are happening with the rioting, the looting, the um, institutions that are changing. And some of us see those things as bad, as negative, but they see them as good. They see them as positive. Let's think for a moment as we're considering the moral decline of the United States and how that it is changing, let's just recognize the fact that the United States was founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic, a Judeo-Christian worldview. And there are some things that are kind of fundamental to that worldview. One of those things is that God is the creator. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Remember, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there are many of us who look at that, we accept that, we believe it, that God created the heavens and the earth. He created the entire universe. And so that gives us a certain perspective of this universe, that it is governed by God, that God is the one to whom we are accountable. We recognize that God made man. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says there, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created us, created human beings. Again, that says we are accountable to God. In Second Peter chapter 1, we believe that God revealed his will to men. In 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, what is contained in the Bible is not the product of men, of the philosophies of men, the wisdom of men, of any individual man or group of men who have come together. This is not a collection of the wise sayings of the philosophers of Greece or Rome or any other ancient civilization. This is a divine, inerrant revelation of God. That's what the Judeo-Christian worldview believes. That's the position that people who hold to that worldview, that, that's the position they take. And we understand that we're going to be judged by the Word of God. As Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So we're going to be judged by the Word of God. That is, our lives are going to be compared to the Word of God and whether or not we lived up to it. Just as ancient Israel, 
and their conduct and their society, their nation was compared to the word of God. <clears throat> and when they were found wanting, God moved against them. We understand that we individually are going to stand before God and give an account for all things done in our lives. That's the Judeo-Christian worldview. Also, though, in Romans chapter 2, our worldview is we are going to spend eternity somewhere. So God created the heavens and the earth. God created man. God revealed his will to man, and God's going to hold man accountable to that will and either reward them or punish them for all eternity. In Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, it says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So again, God's going to hold us all accountable. Notice what he says. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. So for those who are submissive to God and following his will, they're going to have eternal glory. They're going to be in the presence of God forever. But notice what he says about those who don't seek to honor God. But to those, this is Romans 2 verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So God will reward the righteous and he will punish the wicked. That is part of the Judeo-Christian worldview. We're accountable. So that governs our behavior in this world because we believe we're going to have to give an account and there are going to be consequences to our behavior. The secular humanist view rejects all of these things. It rejects that there is a God who created the universe. It rejects the idea that God created man rejects the idea that God revealed his will to man and that man is accountable to that and rejects the idea that there is an eternal reward or an eternal punishment. So these are two radically different worldviews that we see. Now, the changes that we are observing in our society seem to be rapid. They seem to be happening so quickly and you know, in a sense, they are happening very rapidly. It seems like there's just one thing after another after another, and it goes from bad to worse. But it's been taking place for many decades now. We have to look back and observe and acknowledge that these things did not just happen overnight. They may be things that are being exposed or being revealed or coming out quickly, but the problems and the fundamental issues that have eaten away at the Judeo-Christian ethic, that have eaten away at the foundation of our society, have been taking place for decades now. You think about the idea of evolution and its foundation at the root, if you will, of secular humanism. You think about Darwinism and how that came to be popularized in the late 1800s, especially coming up into the 1900s, so into the 20th century. And now, of course, in the 21st century, Darwinism pretty well dominates the academic world around us, the scientific world, the, the uh, very much so, not all scientists, of course, except Darwinism. But many do, and that's kind of the established status quo and how that that has had an impact in our society. And through that, that's one aspect of it, but that in many other ways that our education system has been secularized and how it's gone further and further away from God and away from the Bible. And there's so much more that is 
taken place in our society. And there are many factors and examples, and we're going to look at a few in just a moment. But there is one major factor at the root of all of it that we want to talk about. And when we talk about it toward the end of this lesson, it's something that may shock you. It may be very surprising to you to realize what it is that is really wrong with our society, why it is that we have the problems that we have now. And so we're going to consider that in the light of the Word of God. And when you consider it in the light of God's Word, you will see very plainly what the problem is and very plainly as well what the remedy is. So we want to continue on in this study in just a moment. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's continue on now in our study on the decline of a nation. We want to look now at examples of the moral decline in our nation. We'll begin by looking at some things that have taken place recently, but then we're going to back up and notice some things that have taken place in the decades prior. So, first of all, as reported by conservativereview.com, there was this case, and, and you probably heard about it, but where a prayer was closed out in Congress, the opening session of the most recent Congress, it was closed with a man and a woman. It was at the opening of the 2021 session of the U.S. Congress, and this prayer was conducted or led by U.S. Representative Emmanuel Cleaver. Uh, he is an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. And in the prayer, he made an appeal to a Hindu god named Brahma. And when he closed it, as we said before, he closed it out with a man and a woman. Now, you've probably already noticed this. You've probably heard people report it. You probably know it from your study of the Bible. If you don't, the word amen means let it be or so be it. In other words, it's an affirmation of what has been prayed. So when somebody says, you know, Lord, heal the sick in Jesus' name, amen, they're saying let it be. So let the sick people be healed. And when others say amen, what they're doing is they're assenting to what has been prayed. They're saying we agree, we approve, and we are appealing to God for what has been prayed, what we have petitioned him for, or what has been said in that prayer. And so you think about a, an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church and an elected representative who's leading a prayer before Congress. He says, amen, and a woman. It shows, first of all, his extreme ignorance of the word of God and what the meaning of the word amen actually is. And it reveals, if that's not the case, we'll say it reveals his biased view on current issues in our society. But then also, you may have heard of this as well, as reported in thehill.com, that Congress is now supposed to use gender-neutral terms. So these are like rules of conduct for the congressmen, and they're supposed to use gender-neutral terms. So Congressman, they could not use that, right? Well, um, here's some of the things that have been reported about that. Uh, 
So it says, in addition to permanently establishing an Office of Diversity and Inclusion and other diversity measures, the proposed package would honor all gender identities. They honor all gender identities by changing pronouns and familial relationships in the House rules to be gender neutral. So you can't say father and mother. You have to say something like parent. Uh, you can't say brother, sister is something like sibling. That's, that's the way they want congressmen to uh, conduct themselves when they are in the House of Representatives. Now, here's the thing about it. There are only two genders as established by God, as created by God. We go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you remember what it says here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and so on. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created man in his image, and the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. God created a man and God created a woman. And we submit to you those are the only two genders that have ever existed in all the history of mankind, either a male or a female. But now we're being told by society around us, we're being told now by political leaders and academics and all kinds of people, no, no, there are not two genders. There are many genders and so people can identify by these other genders, whatever kind of word they want to apply to that, however they want to rationalize that. The reality is there are only two genders. That's established in the Word of God. And by the way, it's established in science. Science knows there's only two genders. And it's integral to marriage, of course. In Genesis 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore, let a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So you have a man marry a woman, a male marry a female, and they become husband and wife. That's marriage. That's what it is. That's what the Word of God defines it as. But there are people trying to tell us that that's not the way that it is. And we look at that and we just scratch our heads, you know, especially some of us who are older and we look back and we never could have imagined when we were in elementary or high school or even college age or young 20s, we, we could not have imagined people would be claiming these kinds of things because they sound so outlandish and they are outlandish. But here's another example. This was reported in the dailycaller.com that third graders are told to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities. Third graders are told to do this. This was an exercise or a, a lesson that they went through in class. So here's some of the things that were reported concerning that. It says a public elementary school in California reportedly instructed third grade students to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities in order to understand power and privilege, according to Discovery Institute scholar Christopher Rufo. Now, it says that this school, which is located in Cupertino, uh, California, Cupertino Union School District, or, I'm sorry, in Santa San Jose, California, says this, reportedly held a lesson on social identities during a math class for third grade students where teachers, the teacher asked students to list their race, class, gender, religion, and family structure in an identity map. And so, Third graders, think about that. Third grade, in a math class, they have this kind of lesson. If that's not a social agenda, I don't know what is. But listen to this. It said that they uh, read, or the teacher read to the students from a particular book. I'm not even going to cite the book um, to give it any exposure. But one of the examples the book gives is that heterosexual considered handsome and speaks English, has more privilege than a black transgender woman. So a 
white male that speaks English or a white female that speaks English has more privilege than a black transgender woman. And so you see what they're setting up here, that being transgender is just as legitimate and normal as being a heterosexual individual. So the teacher told students that people who have privilege have power over others, and some people may have features of their identity that give them power, while other features mean they're oppressed. So automatically, if you are a white heterosexual, you have privilege, and people who are not that are oppressed. No, um, no other qualifications on that. They're saying that is just the, the way that things are. In Romans chapter 1, I want us to notice this. So you think about what they're saying here when they refer to terms like heterosexual and transgender. What they're really driving at is that homosexual behavior and transgender, I don't even know, I guess you call it behavior or action or attitude, whatever you want to describe that as, that those things are normal and acceptable to be embraced, to be promoted, to be upheld, and the other things need to be punished. Heterosexuality needs to be punished. So what I want us to do is notice what the Bible says about these kinds of things, about homosexuality or what people call transgenderism. Um, Romans chapter 1, Romans 1 verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So basically what the Bible says about homosexuality and transgenderism says it's perversion. It uses terms like this, uncleanness. They dishonor their bodies. They have vile passions. They do that which is against nature. It's unnatural. It's against the way that human beings are created by God in the image of God. It says these things are shameful. So when they are teaching children or promoting it in any other form in our society to any other group. They're doing things that are dishonorable, vile, against nature, unnatural, shameful. They should be ashamed of it. Now, we can go back into our history and see that there's a steady march down to this point. So think about these things. How do we get to the point where third graders are being taught to deconstruct their sexual identities and told that transgender people are oppressed because there are other people who are heterosexual. Well, think about what happened just a few years back. The legalization of same-sex marriage, huge issue in our nation not that long ago. Before that, we had the legalization of abortion. Before that, we had the banning of the Bible, God, prayer out of the public school system uh, and public forums. You think about what's happened, and this has been, you know, even in the past 10 to 20 years, how that city councils are not allowed to have prayers, uh, ball games where 
people are gathering to see their children play ball. They're not supposed to have prayers in many places. Um, in courthouses, not supposed to have a copy of the Ten Commandments representing that Judeo-Christian ethic on which our society and our justice system is supposed to be built. So all these things have been taking place and there, there's been one little step or sometimes one large step at a time, but it, it just keeps coming. It's a relentless march that has happened. And so that's in part why we are seeing such a rapid advancement of this other world view of the secular humanist worldview and its perversion and how that many of us who have some concept and some appreciation for the Judeo-Christian worldview, how that's alarming us, that's causing us concern about our society, about our families, and where our nation is headed. And I want to talk about why this is happening. Why is this taking place? And it may shock you as to what I see is going on and has been going on in our society for a long time. So come back in a moment and we want to look at why our nation is declining. We've looked at some of the things going on in our society, and there are many, many more that show there is a decline. There is a moral decline in our society. There is the advancement of secular humanism and the retreat or the eroding of Judeo-Christian ethics and morals and that worldview. And the question is, why is that happening? And this is the part that we're getting to in our study that will be hard for some people to accept. There will be a very um, maybe quick reaction or initial reaction that they don't want to accept this as true because they don't want to admit that the problem really does exist. And that's what we have to do is look at the problem, truly identify that problem so that it can be addressed if anything is to be done about what is happening in our society. Now, I want us to understand that what's happening is not, is not because the education system is corrupt. You know, there are people who want to look at the education system and say, well, that ed education system is corrupt and that's why our society is headed down this path. There, there's where the problem is and we need to reform the education system. Well, there is a problem with the public education system from, as we've already seen, elementary school all the way through university level. And we need to recognize, though, that that is just a symptom. The, the corruption of that education system is a symptom of the problem. And let's understand that what's happening in our nation is not because politicians have failed us, because our political leaders have gone astray. That, that is true, but again, that's a symptom of what is really the problem here. It's not because the judicial system has decayed. It's not because the family has collapsed. Those are symptoms. And so we can see the problems. The question is, what's behind that? What's at the root of the problem? What, what is the cause of everything that's going on, of the problems that we see around us? And let me submit this to you that here's the problem. It is because those who claim to be Christians have failed to honor God. They have failed to truly submit to Him and to serve Him. And when we state this, we're talking about both individuals and institutions that claim to be Christian institutions or what we might say religious groups, or very commonly referred to as churches. Okay, so individuals and churches that claim to be Christian 
have failed to serve, to submit to, and to honor God. That is the problem. And then all these other things flow from that reality. You have these groups that pay lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ, who honor him with their mouth, they honor him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. They do not keep his commandments. And this is just like ancient Israel. When we began this study in this episode, that it's just like ancient Israel, that they turned away from God and would not keep his commandments. You have today people who are doing what is right in their own eyes. Remember all the way back in the book of Judges, the book of Judges, that book where you see just one problem after another among the Israelites and their enemies attack them and they're oppressed and they have problems and they humble themselves. They cry out to God for help. God sent a judge to deliver them from that oppression and things go well for a little while, but they go right back into it. Now, here's what Judges 21, 25 says about all of that. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so there were many problems in the land of Canaan and among the Israelites because everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. When it says there was no king in our modern context, what we're talking about, there is no adherence to a central authority of religion. Okay, we're going to get to what that is in just a little bit, but people have decided they're going to do what they want to do and what pleases them what sounds good to them instead of adhering to what the Lord has commanded. And because of that, as Proverbs 14 verse 34 says, that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, if we were adhering to the word of God, then we would be exalted as a nation. And we wouldn't have the problems we're seeing around us in education, in the judicial system, in the families, and all those things. But we're not adhering to God's word. We're not following his commandments. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 7 to be a little more specific about this. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, let's read verses 21 to 23. And notice that not everyone who claims that Jesus is the Lord lives like Jesus is their Lord. So Matthew 7, 21, this is Jesus speaking, says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, the Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and done many wonders in your name, cast out demons in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, there are people who say that they are a Christian. There are groups, there are churches that say they are Christian churches but they are not doing the will of the Father in heaven. Notice what Jesus is saying there. There are many who claim him as Lord, but he doesn't recognize them. And he says they're not getting into heaven because they don't do the will of the Father. They are not following his commandments. So how have religious groups, these churches, how have individuals not kept the will of the Father? Now, this is where we get down to the bare truth. And this is where some people are going to pull back a bit. But I submit to you that a very glaring, very obvious example of where you have the revealed will of God 
and then you have men doing something else, is the way that people choose to identify themselves before God. And we're talking about those who claim to be Christians. So the Bible tells us that Christians are identified or described as disciples, right? Or Christians. In Acts chapter 11, Acts 11, notice verse 26 here. It says, and when he had found him, that is Barnabas had found Saul of Tarsus. It says, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So those who were followers of Jesus Christ were called disciples and Christians. You can read on through the New Testament and you can see where they were called brethren as well. They were called saints. So there are various terms that are used in the New Testament to identify those who said Jesus was Lord, those who submitted to his will, those who were followers of Christ. So you have those different ways they're described as individuals in the New Testament and different ways that they're described collectively. Here you understand that it uses the term church. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 2, notice how the church at Corinth is described. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So church of God is a designation for a collective or a group of disciples, a group of Christians, that they were people who worked and worshiped together. You go back to Romans 16, verse 16. Romans 16, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So there are many different churches, many different congregations that he has in mind here, and he describes them as churches of Christ. So you have church, you have Church of God, you have Churches of Christ, you have Body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, the apostle says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You see, you have things in the New Testament, the inspired Word of God that reveals how disciples, how Christians, how individuals who followed Jesus, how they were termed or described, how they were identified, the names that were given to them. We have that revealed to us in the New Testament. But when you look in the religious world around us, people use other ways to identify themselves. So think about this. They identify themselves as Methodist or Baptist, or Presbyterian, or Lutheran. And none of those terms, and there are many others, and none of those terms are used in the Word of God to describe and talk about individual Christians as followers of Christ or groups of Christians who would worship the Lord. None of those things are used. You see, men introduce those things. And that's how they wanted to identify themselves as distinct from others who had a different designation or identification. So if they say they're a Methodist that you know, well, they're not a Baptist. And a Baptist, you know, is not a Catholic. And a Presbyterian is not a Mormon. But you have all these different names that are used to describe, they used to describe themselves that are not founded in in the Word of God. So that means men acted on their own authority. They did what was right in their own eyes. Now, some people think, well, this departure is small. You know, what's what's the big deal in designating yourself one way or another? Well, let's look at 2 John. 2 John verse 9 beginning. And just think about this in light of what the Apostle John writes here. He says in 2 John verse 9, whoever transgresses 
and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So he says there's a doctrine of Christ. There, there is truth. And if you go beyond that truth, you transgress the doctrine of Christ. You do not have God. It's as plain and as simple as that. Notice Colossians chapter 3 to go along with that. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 here. The Apostle Paul writes this by inspiration. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When it says to do something in the name of the Lord, it's talking about by his authority, right? Just like in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's not giving a formula and saying you need to use those words specifically when somebody is baptized. He's saying do it by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So people, we understand, do not adhere to that authority. And they decide we're going to call ourselves whatever we want to call ourselves, what sounds good to us, what we like the term we come up with, as opposed to using what the Bible teaches. So think about that, that there is the authority and the revealed will of God, but men do not honor that when they call themselves and identify themselves by something that's not revealed in the Word of God. That is one way, that's one of those steps that eats away at the very fundamental idea of a devotion to and an honoring of our Creator and our Savior. And we want to come back in just a moment and notice a couple of other things related to this. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Okay, let's remind ourselves when we're thinking about how men depart from the Word of God. And we talked about how they identify themselves and that it's that departure that's at the root of what's happening in our society. And just the illustration of one way they've done it for decades, even centuries now, is by using terms to describe themselves as individuals or as groups that are not found in the Word of God. And in Matthew chapter 7, let's go back to what Jesus said just to remind ourselves of the fundamental principles here. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So not everyone who claims Jesus as Lord who believes in him as a savior is going to go to heaven. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, one of the things we recognize here that Jesus says your motivation doesn't matter. If you're not doing the will of the Father, it doesn't matter that you're trying to please me, you're trying to honor me, that you're doing it in sincerity. You know, haven't we done all these things in your name? 
He says, you haven't done the will of the Father. I never knew you. Depart from me. So motivation is not an excuse because you have the right motive doesn't excuse you from ignoring the will of God. Let's notice another way. Not only in name do men depart from the word of God, but the way they organize themselves in these religious bodies. The Bible, let's first of all notice, reveals that there are two levels of organization for Christians. One is the universal body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church is the body, and Christ is the head of that body. So Christ is the head, and Christians are the body. That's the universal body. Another way the Bible describes it is, that you have a kingdom, and Christ is king, and all those who are Christians are citizens of that kingdom. So there are different ways the Bible describes the universal body, but there is just one universal body. Now, that's one way that the group of disciples are described, and this is talking about the disciples over the whole earth. Now, the second way that disciples are described as a group or organized rather as a group is in local congregations in Philippians chapter one, Philippians chapter one and verse two or verse one, rather Philippians one, verse one, Paul and Timothy bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops of and deacons. Okay, so you have all the saints in Philippi. You have a church there, a local congregation. And he says they have bishops and deacons. Another term for bishops is elders or shepherds or pastors. So they had multiple pastors, shepherds, bishops that were overseeing the work there. Then it says deacons. These are servants of the church and they're specific and special servants of the church. They're not just regular members who serve one another, but they have the office of a deacon. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 and following there, you have qualifications for elders. Somebody who's going to be an elder or a bishop, as it's described here in Philippians 1, uh, you're going to be an elder, a bishop, a shepherd, a pastor. Here's qualifications you need to meet. And it goes on to talk about the qualifications of deacons. But here's the thing. You have a local church and the organization of that local church. You're supposed to have bishops, and deacons. That's what we see in the Word of God. We understand that evangelists or preachers work among them. Second Timothy chapter 4, as Paul writes to Timothy, he says, do the work of an evangelist. He tells them to preach the Word. So he's a preacher. So preachers work among them as well. But that's the organization. You have a local church, a specific place where saints gather together as a group in order to worship, in order to carry out the work of the Lord and teaching the gospel to people, upholding that truth in this world. And then we see the universal church. Those are the two ways that we read in the Bible that the saints of God are organized. Now, one thing to note, when you read in the New Testament, there is no earthly universal organization or hierarchy in the church. So all you read about is Christ being the head of the body. That's it. Or Christ being king over his kingdom. That's it. There's no earthly headquarters. There's no earthly organization where they tie each other together and money flows to one place or flows out of one place. We don't read that in the New Testament, just a universal body that is under Christ. And then you read about local congregations that have 
human leadership in them, bishops, deacons, things like that. So having said that, think about how men organize their religious groups, the religious organizations. They organize religious bodies in things that are smaller than the universal church, but larger than a local church. And they call these denominations, sort of like our currency has denominations, right? You have a $1, $5, $10 bill. You have the, the coins that are denominations, even smaller. But it's the idea that they denominate out, they separate out. And that's what men have done with their religious groups. They've denominated, they divided up among themselves in different groups. And as we said before, they call themselves by different names. But what about that form of governance that they have, right? In the New Testament, you read about Christ being the king and then Christians being in the kingdom or citizens of that kingdom. But religions of men are organized differently. They are organized sometimes in somewhat of a democracy. And so the people vote and they vote on what to believe, uh, what their convictions are, what their organization is. They vote on what type of worship they're going to have, things like that, what they do in worship, um, how they're going to be um, doing work and splitting up the money and stuff like that. And you know what? Nowhere in the Bible do you see anybody having a vote on the doctrine of Christ. It just is not there. There's no voting on morals, right? God revealed that through the Holy Spirit, and that's it. Nobody has a right to vote on that. Then sometimes... There's organizations among men that we might say is like an aristocracy, that there's an elite class or an elite group that oversees and rules in a religious body. But the New Testament church, the one you read about in your Bible, is not ruled by an elite class of men who determine church beliefs and practices. It's not in the Word of God. And yet we see that in the world around us where there's a, a group of men, like in Roman Catholicism, you've got the, the bishops, the archbishops, you've got then the Pope who sits on top, but you kind of have that ruling class that tells everybody else, here's what we believe. And those beliefs change over time. When you have these groups that have votes, and they have democracy, they elect representatives, they choose representatives to go to their national body or their world body, and then they get together and they have, uh, you know, this large assembly to determine what the church doctrine beliefs work and all of that's going to be. That's not anything you read about in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And so you understand that when they change that organization, they change that form of governance, that's when you get things like different names that are not found in the Bible, and you get different practices that are not found in the Bible. You think about how that they have changed worship and leadership that is revealed in the Bible. Just notice one thing on that in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And... Let's notice here, 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. Let not a woman learn, or let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. You think about how many religious organizations these days have women as the preachers with a mixed audience. It's not saying women can't teach women or women can't teach non-Christians. What it's saying is that you have male leadership in the body of Christ. In the local congregation, bishops, deacons, preachers, it's to be men. 
And the Bible is very explicit about that. But they get together, they have their votes, and they change that. And so they have women in those positions. The Bible says that is reserved for men. Now, because these changes have taken place, the door has been open to change anything that the Bible teaches. So there are religious groups that identify themselves as Christians. They say they are in the tradition of Christianity. They say Jesus is the Savior, but that's in doubt among some of them. But be that as it may, they come out and they say, you know, the universe is a result of evolution and not special creation by God. Some of them try to marry two things together. They try to say, well, yeah, God created, but God did it through the evolutionary process. And that's a compromise with the world, with secular humanism. The Bible's very clear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to describe the six days of creation. That's it. There is no other room for any other understanding about how the universe came into existence. You know, they reject God's moral law because, again, think about the process here. They decide that they're going to be organized and uh, run their churches differently than what the Bible reveals, that they're going to vote on things, that men are going to have discussions and debates and decide what the church stands for, what it doesn't stand for, what it does in worship or practice, what it doesn't do. And so they change the name of the church in addition to that, something not found in the Bible. And so they change these other things. They change God's moral laws or try to. Of course, these laws don't change but they begin to stand for, advocate, and practice things that are contrary to the will of God, like abortion, right? The Presbyterian Church USA, totally fine with abortion. There are religious groups who claim to be Christians that support abortion when the Bible says that it is murder. And 1 Peter 4, verse 15, no one who is a Christian is to be a murderer. So they change or reject, we should say, God's moral law. They reject God's moral law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And this is a huge one among religious people. It's just like they've completely ignored what the Bible teaches on this. In Matthew 19, 9, listen to what Jesus said. And then you think about people and their families, people and their marriages around you. Maybe this applies to you. It's something you need to think about. But Matthew 19, 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. See, people all around us, including in these religious groups that say that they are Christian, they get married and divorced two times, three times, and they act like it's no big deal. They go on this notion very often, well, God wants me to be happy. Well, God wants you to be faithful to him, not to please yourself, but to please him. That's what he wants of you. That's what he commands of you. But yet, these religious groups reject that. They don't hold people accountable to what the Lord teaches. There are religious groups that have accepted homosexuality that not only do they accept them as openly, actively practicing homosexuals as members, but there are religious groups now that are promoting them into the leadership of those religious organizations. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the, uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. It's sinful. But they just ignore what God's word says. They accept the men promote them, and celebrate them. And there are many, many more things. So this is why, this is why 
you can have an ordained United Methodist minister leading a prayer in Congress that appeals to a Hindu God, and he closes out that prayer with a man and a woman. This is why, because people don't respect the word of God. And in some cases, we look at that and we say, well, they, they've ignored the word of God in what we think of as minor ways, but it's what laid the groundwork. It's what paved the way for these, what we consider to be bigger departures. But when God looks at it, he says a departure from his word is a departure from his word. Rebellion toward God is rebellion. And it doesn't matter how big or small we think it is. And so what we're appealing to you about is that you consider what we're talking about here. You know, until men and women and the religious groups with which they are associated return to the Bible alone as a rule of faith and practice, the decay and the rot in our society will continue and it will keep getting worse. So we urge you to examine the Bible for yourself. Compare the religions of the world around you, the, the churches, the denominations that you see. Compare them. Really sit down with your Bible, read through it, and compare them to what you see in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And you will see differences. And you'll see sometimes what you might consider to be small differences, but at other times you're going to see major differences. So when you see that, we call on you to reject the doctrines and commandments of men. Only adhere to the doctrine of Christ. Only accept the doctrine of Christ. Submit to God fully in your life. Not partially. Not doing what's right in your own eyes, but doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. We encourage you to contact us to study these things in greater detail. There's much more we could get into. And we would love to sit down with you and talk to you about these things. And maybe the religious group of which you've been a part. We have members of our congregation here that have come out of the religions of men recognizing that's not what the New Testament teaches. I just want to do what's written in the Word of God. And we encourage you to have that same type of attitude. If you want, come and visit us in our services. Visit in our Bible classes or visit in our worship services. We would love to have you with us because we want to study the Word of God with you. And if there's something that we're teaching or we're doing that's wrong, that's not found and not authorized by the Word of God, let us know. And we want to sit down with you and study that as well because we simply want to do what the Lord would have us to do. We don't want to just call Him Lord with our mouth, but our hearts are far from Him. We want to honor Him with our mouth and our hearts, with our mind, body, and soul, as Jesus talks about. And so we encourage you, consider these things and reach out to us and let us know how that we can help you. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, 
you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to in this segment we want to continue in our series of studies in a guide that we have published the title of that guide is how to study the bible and you can download your own pdf copy of it for free at wordandsword.com slash how to. That's wordandsword.com slash how to, all one word. We've looked at the first two lessons in previous episodes, and in this one, we want to look at the third lesson. The third lesson is really about context and about considering all that is written on a particular subject in the Word of God. The actual title of the third chapter is It is Written Again. And we're going to do like we've done before, just kind of read down through this, maybe make some comments along the way, and to go through this with you. Again, you're welcome to to download your own PDF copy and follow along as we study through these things, or uh, you can go and reread through it later to assist in your study. Of the Word of God. But we begin uh, again in chapter 3. It is written again. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he defeated him by answering with the Word of God in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 10. If you remember, each time the Lord was tempted, he responded, It is written. And so he answered with Scripture. Now, the devil tried to use scripture to lure Jesus into sin when the devil quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. And here is what is written in Matthew chapter 4 concerning that. Here's what's recorded. This is Satan speaking. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and... In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Again, that's the devil quoting from Psalm 91. So he was trying to get Jesus to throw himself off the temple by quoting scripture. Pretty pretty slick, huh? Well, Jesus replied with additional scripture. He said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So that's recorded in Matthew 4. Verse 7, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. In other words, what Satan quoted was not the only thing said about the matter. He quoted truth, but he misapplied it. This illustrates the importance of considering all the Bible says on a point before drawing a firm conclusion. We also know that context must be respected or we will not understand or properly apply what is said. 
Therefore, we will study the importance of comprehensive and contextual study. So first of all, consider all points on a subject. You know, we need to avoid falling into the devil's trap of taking only one or two passages on a subject and holding them as the final word when there is more to be said in the word of God. What Jesus pointed out from Deuteronomy modified the passage from Psalm 91, that is, from what the devil quoted. A New Testament illustration of this issue is circumcision. So let's think about that for a minute. You know, Paul refused to allow Titus to be circumcised in Galatians chapter 2. Yet on another occasion, Paul took Timothy and circumcised him in Acts 16. So he refused to let one man be circumcised, but he went and personally circumcised another man. If we just look at Galatians 2, when he refused to allow Titus to be circumcised, we may think no man should be circumcised. If we focus only on Acts 16, where he circumcised Timothy, we may think all men must be circumcised. However, when we consider both together, we know that a man may be circumcised, but it's not required. The reason Paul refused to allow Titus to be circumcised is because some were trying to bind it as a matter of doctrine. They were trying to bind it as a matter of salvation and to be pleasing to God. In another place, Paul said, For if Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation, Galatians 6.15. Some may wonder how they find all the passages that address a particular subject. After all, who has the entire Bible memorized? I don't. So I use a tool. And one of the best tools and one of the most basic ways to find passages on certain Bible subjects is to use a Bible app. Or if you prefer printed books, you can use an exhaustive concordance. It takes a little more work to do that, but it certainly can be done. With Bible apps, it's as simple as entering keywords, that you're looking for a phrase maybe and see a list of passages where those things are found. And many have features where you can see the original definition of the word and that uh, may uh, be included with your app or it may be something you purchase to add to your app. But either way, it's very easy to do that search and there are a lot of free online tools as well to go and to search out what the scriptures say. So, Let's think about this for a minute and apply this to another issue, another issue with which a lot of people struggle because of what they've been taught, and that issue is New Testament baptism. And the question we want to present and then go through and answer it with the Word of God is, is baptism sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? Sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, because you can look in the religious world around you and see where people practice all kinds of different things as it relates to baptism. Uh, and that includes the mode of baptism, the form of baptism. Is it any of the three? Well, if we apply the principles of considering all passages pertaining to the form of baptism or the mode of baptism, then we're going to see the answer jump right out at us. Now, if we begin in Matthew and look for passages that contain baptism, baptize, baptize, and so on, things like that, as you go through these, notice the ones that have information relating to the mode or the form of baptism. You will find in Matthew chapter 3, verse 6, that it says John baptized people in the river Jordan. Okay, so he baptized people in a river. After Jesus was baptized by John, it tells us in Matthew 3.16 that he, that is Jesus, came up immediately from the water. So he came up out of the water. As you go on, you will come to John chapter 3, verse 23, where it mentions that John was baptizing in Anon near Salem, 
because there was much water there. In Acts chapter 8, verse 38, it says, Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So, as we've gone rather quickly through these different passages, what we've noticed is baptism involved much water with people getting into and out of that water, which would seem to point to baptism as an immersion. But if you go further and you study more, you're going to see definitive evidence and proof as to the exact mode of baptism. Paul said the Romans were buried with him that is with Christ through baptism into death, Romans 6, 4. He told the Colossians that they had been buried with him in baptism, Colossians 2, verse 12. So an obvious question to ask is, what is burial? Okay, if the Romans and the Colossians were buried in baptism, well, what is burial? For, for you and I, maybe we just instinctively know, we just automatically know because we're familiar with what burial is. You know, it is not sprinkling or pouring a little bit of dirt or even a bucket of dirt over a body. But burial is a full encasement. The body is surrounded by the dirt or rock or whatever substance it, it is into which it is laid to rest. So our common form of burial in our nation is they dig a six-foot hole in the ground and they put the body that's in a casket down in there and then they cover it up so that body is surrounded by the earth, by the dirt. So the mode of baptism or the form of baptism in the New Testament, let's understand when Paul describes it as a burial, that tells us that baptism is an immersion. It's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. It's an immersion. That's what the scriptures teach. Now, we easily come to that conclusion when we consider all the passages in the New Testament that address baptism, or at least the mode or the form of baptism. And that, that could be applied not only to the mode or the form of baptism, but the reason for baptism. Why are you baptized? Go through the New Testament and study and see. The conclusion you'll come to is we're baptized for salvation. But we go on. Consider the context. Another problem that many people encounter is taking things out of context. And you know, televangelists are famous for this. And right now you may be thinking, well, aren't you a televangelist? Well, in a way, yes, but that's not how I think of myself. I think of myself as a Christian who teaches and it just happens to be through the medium of video. But be that as it may, you know, the typical televangelist, we're talking about the big name guys, the guys who get really excited on TV. You know, they will quote passages about giving and sacrifice and then make it mean that you have to give and sacrifice for them. Give them your money. To give them your paycheck, if you will. You know, if we take passages out of context, we can justify it so many things that the Bible doesn't teach. For instance, we can justify people killing themselves. We can do that. Because Matthew 27, 25 says Judas hanged himself. And Luke 10, 37, Jesus said, go and do likewise. So would it be right for us to tell people, look, you need to go and hang yourself because Jesus said, go and do likewise. Well, you know, two passages that we've looked at, Matthew 27 and Luke 10, on this, they have nothing to do with each other. But if misused, they lead to, of course, terrible and unbiblical consequences. And maybe you look at that as I do, and it's like, that's absurd. But if you just pick and choose different passages and stick them together, 
it creates a new meaning. It creates something different uh, when you just randomly do these kinds of things. So the way to counteract taking things out of context is to simply read the context. You know, most misunderstandings can be corrected by reading a few verses before or after the passage that's under consideration. Reading the entire chapter, the surrounding chapters, or the entire book will also avoid many questions and clear up a lot of confusion. Just read through it all and you'll see the context in which something was stated and you'll have a better understanding of what is being said. You know, Judas killed himself in deep grief over betraying the Lord. That's recorded in Matthew 27. If we also consider other passages on the subject, we know that Judas was doomed to destruction. He was doomed to perdition for his actions. You can find that in John 17, verse 12, or Acts 1, verse 25. Now, the other passage that we talked about where Jesus said, go and do likewise in Luke 10, 37, that's an entirely unrelated event, has no connection whatsoever to what Judas did. Jesus had just finished telling the parable of the Good Samaritan and the one who had come to him and asked him the question and challenged him. When Jesus finished telling that parable of the Good Samaritan, he told the man to go and do likewise. So it had nothing to do with Judas killing himself. But we see this illustrates how if you take two different things from two different places, you can get a meaning that's never intended in the Word of God. So context matters, and we want to think now about context both narrow and broad. A specific issue that comes up in some religions is marriage. Is marriage good or bad? You know, some say that celibacy is a superior form of living or way of living, superior to marriage. And they will quote the Apostle Paul in an attempt to prove it. They'll quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, where Paul said, For I wish that all men were even as I myself. And Paul not being married, they say, see, Paul says, and the Bible teaches, that it's better if you're not married. Well, when the entire chapter is read, it's obvious Paul does not say celibacy is a higher calling. Notice that he is answering specific questions that the Corinthians had asked. Just read 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. He said it's okay to marry. It will even help to guard against the sin of fornication. So Paul approves of marriage and even says in certain situations, you need to do it so you don't fall into sin. Also, Paul wrote of the things in 1 Corinthians 7, Verse 26, he says, in light of the present distress. You know, the Corinthians were facing persecution. And if a man were married, he would be concerned about the treatment of his wife and any children they had. So he might compromise the faith to spare his family. This is why Paul said he wished others were as he was. That is, that others were unmarried just like he was unmarried. So you wouldn't have that concern. You can make decisions and sacrifices more easily. Now, as we broaden the context to the Bible, we see and consider all that is written about marriage. We learn that God, of course, made marriage and he made it for man's benefit. Back in Genesis chapter 2, when he created Adam and Eve, he brought them together as husband and wife. So God ordains marriage. He established it from the very beginning. It's the oldest institution, the oldest relationship that exists among men. So the wise man said in Proverbs 8, 20, 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. We also know that one who is a church leader, whether a bishop or deacon, must be married according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So celibacy is not a higher call than marriage. Rather, the Bible teaches us that marriage is honorable. Marriage is right and good. 
So context, narrow and broad, really does matter. You know, rarely is there just one passage that addresses a particular subject. Sometimes there is one passage that you go to that answers a question, and that's the only passage in the Bible related to that issue. And that's authoritative, and that's something you need to stick to. In those cases, you don't need to go anywhere else. And it would be confusing, maybe even, to go somewhere else. But, but, that's very, very rare. Usually there's multiple passages on a particular subject. There's an abundance of information in the Word of God that helps give us a complete picture about what God teaches and would have us to do on any particular issue. But Satan tries to hide this from us. Satan wants to twist things. He wants us to have a particular understanding, or more precisely, a misunderstanding of God's Word so that we depart from God and live in sin. However, if we take into account other passages, like the Lord did, then we can do exactly what he did, and we can overcome the devil. We can defeat the temptation and remain loyal to God. So we encourage you, study the Word of God, study that context, study all that the Bible has to say about a particular subject, and since we are under the New Testament today, specifically study what the New Testament says about how we are to obey God and serve God today, how we are to worship Him, how we are saved. Study what the New Testament says about that so that you can be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. Well, that wraps up chapter 3 in our study guide on how to study the Bible. We invite you to go and download your own copy at wordandsword.com slash howto, wordandsword.com slash howto. If you have questions, reach out to us. We would love to sit down with you and study more from the Word of God and about the Word of God to help you gain a greater understanding of the will of the Lord. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. We continue now in our series of studies in the book of 1 Peter. And our study now is in 1 Peter chapter 5. We want to begin by simply reading verses 1 through 4 and understand how Peter is closing out this letter to the brethren. In 1 Peter 5 verse 1, the elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So, first of all, backing up here to verse 1, Peter says, The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. And part of what he's driving at is their common shared experience in serving in the kingdom of God. As he's writing to these elders, what he's writing to them, or the people to whom he's writing, are leaders of a local or maybe different congregations where you might have, you know, a set of elders, let's just say at Rome, there may be a set of elders, then at Antioch, another set of elders down in Jerusalem. But wherever the congregation is, they have their leadership there, and he's writing to these leaders of congregations to encourage and admonish and exhort them. So he says he's writing to them that they're dispersed in different places. 
He says he is a fellow elder. Remember, uh, Peter, of course, was an apostle. And Acts 1 reveals there are certain qualifications that men had to have to be an apostle, including, of course, being handpicked by Jesus Christ. Not just anybody could say, hey, I'm an apostle. You know, today you have people claiming to be apostles. They're not because Jesus had to pick them out. And Peter was qualified as that, so he was an apostle. But did you know also that to be a bishop or a pastor or elder, as it's described here, that to be in that role in a congregation, you have to meet very specific qualifications. They're laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. But there's very specific qualifications, and Peter met those qualifications, which includes being married, having children who are faithful to the Lord. But be that as it may, he was serving as an apostle and at the same time, serving as an elder or a pastor of a local congregation. And he says now in verse 1 again that he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Of course, that was during the trial, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, as well as other times when people would have insulted him and made fun of him and different things like that. But really, this has a specific reference to his trial to his crucifixion, and he's reminding these elders that the chief shepherd knows what it's like to suffer. So whatever these men were going through, the ones to whom Peter was writing, he says, you know, I saw Jesus Christ suffer. He knows what this is about. So he sympathizes with you in what you're going through. But Peter also follows up and says he is a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Peter had confidence there's something better that's coming, and these men needed that admonition. There's something better coming, so stay with it. Hang in there. There's something better that's coming after the suffering. So there's a great reward that is going to come to you. Now, notice it's interesting in verse 2 where he says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So the sphere of authority for a bishop, elder, a pastor, all one and the same, just different designations in the New Testament, the sphere of authority for that individual who serves in that role is in a local congregation. It's not over many congregations, not over a region. Uh, it's over just one local congregation being an overseer of what goes on in that work. And by the way, it's also always with other men, at least two men, if not more, serving in this position in one local congregation. But be that as it may, um, you have these positive and negative exhortations in verses two and three. So the first one he says there, that you serve as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. So don't let others push you into this and bully you into it, pressure you into it, but you do it because you want to do it. You do it willingly because you want to take on that work and serve God's people in that way. Then he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So don't do it for personal financial benefit, however that might come. Don't do it for material reasons, but do it for good reasons, for pure motives, because you're committed to the Lord's cause and to his people. He says, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So what is this idea of lording it over the flock? It's the idea of an individual acting in their own personal best interest and exercising an iron-fisted control, pressuring others with their own personal opinions, not giving consideration to others. That's lording it over the flock. And this happens in areas of judgment where men lord it over the flock. And it's a great danger that can happen if men get into a position of leadership and then just 
have those selfish desires, those selfish impulses, or arrogance, thinking that they know better than everybody else. So he says, don't do this. Don't lord it over the flock, but you need to be involved in serving these people with self-sacrifice, as he talked about earlier in the letter, and set an example in your personal life that you're following the will of God, you're humbly serving God and serving his people. Now, the outcome, he says in verse 4, so when the chief shepherd appears, you will also receive the crown of life or the crown of glory that does not fade away. There's a reward coming for your service and your sacrifice. For all that you've gone through, for God and for his people, there's a reward there that is awaiting you. And that had to encourage them to keep going and serving in the kingdom of God. Now, let's go on and read verses 5 through 11 here. It says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may God, may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So here's a great admonition to all Christians. At the beginning of the chapter, he addressed the elders, the, the leadership in a congregation. Now, verses 5 through 11, he's addressing the members of the congregation. And so he's addressing that relationship that we have to one another, and he says, you younger be submissive to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. So he changed from using elder as a office, as a role in the congregation, to the generic term of elders being older people because he compares the younger to the older here in this case. But be that as it may, he's saying the younger people need to pay attention to the older people that they have wisdom, they have maturity that will benefit them as they go through difficulties, as they have questions, as there are challenges that face them personally in their own life or as a people of God, as a congregation. So you younger, be submissive to your elders. Kind of follow their lead. If they're adhering to the Word of God, they are respecting what is taught in scripture, then you be one who would yield to them and, and follow their lead as older, more mature Christians in serving the Lord. And he says, all of you be submissive to one another. As Philippians chapter two talks about, you know, think about the interest of others and what's going to benefit them. So this would be to the older people that while they have maturity and wisdom, they still need to think about those younger people and some of the things that they're facing or some of the things that would be beneficial to encourage them need to be thinking about that. Because he says there that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So whether young or old, there can be a danger of being filled with pride and not treating your brethren with respect. And so he encourages them to do that. Then he goes on in verses six and seven and says, you need to submit to God. You submit to each other, but don't ever forget that primarily above all things, you submit to God. And when you submit to God, it will lead to you being exalted. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know, God's going to exalt us in his time, not our own time. God's going to lift us up when it's good for us. Because 
as he's talked about in this letter with the suffering they're facing, that suffering is a benefit. It's helpful because it purifies us. It refines us. It makes us stronger. And it shows that we are in fellowship with Christ because we're partakers of his suffering. And here he says, humble yourselves into the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you. Yes, he'll exalt you. But it's in due time, not when we want it, but when he sees it's the right time to exalt you and to raise you up out of those things. And so we need to have patience as we go through it. In verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, the way that Christians do this is by casting their cares on the Lord. They go to him in prayer. They pray about the things that are troubling him and troubling them and bothering them. And they trust in God to act in their best interest. They trust that God is acting in their best interest, that he hears the prayer, that he cares what's happening, and he is going to take action that is good and right. And let's understand that one who is a Christian trusts in God even when he or she does not see changes taking place. So these people are going through suffering, and even though that suffering's not let up and maybe even getting worse, they still trust in God. They haven't given up that faith in Him. They forge ahead in doing what is right, continuing to cast their cares on Him. And so he gives this admonition in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because you have an adversary. The devil is your adversary, and he is like a lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. The Bible describes the devil in such strong terms. Describes him as Abdon and Apollyon in Revelation chapter 9. That's destroyer and destruction. He's described in Revelation 12 as the dragon and the serpent. Matthew 13 He's described as the wicked one. In John 8, Jesus said he's a liar and a murderer. We know that he's the tempter as well. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. He lies to us and he twists the scriptures. He is one who wants to destroy us by any means that he has at his disposal. That's what the devil is and what he wants to do with us. So let's ask this question. Why would we ever want to do the bidding of the devil? If he is a lion that wants to devour us, why would we ever want to listen to him? Why would we ever want him as our master? Of course, we should not want that. We should not allow that to happen. And so Peter tells these Christians here to resist him steadfast in the faith. The only way to resist the devil is in the faith. If we are not in the faith, if we're not living by the word of God, we can't resist the devil. It's just not going to happen. He's going to get the better of us. But let's understand that when Peter writes resist him steadfast in the faith, it means we can resist the devil steadfast in the faith. It's possible and it's necessary. And so when we live by the word of God, we're convicted by it, we submit to it, we act according to the word of God in our lives, then we are able to resist the devil. And he says, don't forget, verse 9, these same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You're not alone. There are others who are going through the same thing that you're going through. So when people become Christians, when they go through difficulties, there is a larger brotherhood of others who are going through facing the same challenges that can be there to encourage you either in word or by example. Now, verses 10 and 11, he basically is, offering a prayer and saying he prays that God would give them the strength that they need. And let's understand again that strength comes from suffering. It builds up our souls and we become more useful in the kingdom of God when we go through suffering. So 
you become a child of God, the devil's going to attack. But if you'll be steadfast in the faith and resist him, that means you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And you'll be in a position and a place to help others in serving God. Now let's wrap up the chapter in verse 17, or verse 12 rather, uh, down through 14. By Salvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he closes out this letter in a beautiful way, talking about the grace of God, that the grace of God would be with them and something in which they stand. This epistle being written here is learning about suffering for the faith and exhortation to endure it, to realize eternal glory. That's what he's driving them toward. That's what he's pointing them toward. And when you think about that, that he's writing that, that's the word of God. And there is grace in that word of God as he is writing these things to him. And so he passes along greetings from various brethren there. And then he closes it out with saying, you know, show love toward one another. Greet one another with a kiss of love. It's just, he's not saying you have to kiss each other when you see each other. He's just simply saying, have that expression of love and of kindness and warmth toward your brethren. And he then says, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. So you're going to find peace in the Lord. And if we can help you to find peace in the Lord. We want to be able to do that. We would love to sit down and study with you. Please reach out to us and let us know. And if you become a child of God, yes, there is suffering ahead of you in your life, but with the Lord, you can get through that. And the ultimate goal then is going to be that crown of life, that crown of glory that is awaiting, and it's only awaiting those who would commit their lives to the Lord at all costs. So if you want to study, please reach out and let us know. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail out of the bulletin or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Peace.